The question of today is, what if Eve never fell? And since it's the Christmas episode, I have a present for all of you. We are extending our sale at the merch store, youngheretics.com forward slash shop, where you can get all our merch, t-shirts, hats, really great quality stuff. The We're Reading Homer and Screw You t-shirt is available exclusively there. Um, and everything is 20% off when you use the promo code CHEERS. It's a new New Year's promo through January 15th. Use the promo code CHEERS. You'll get all this great stuff, 20% off. You can own the libs. You can wear, show your pride and, uh, and wear the Young Heretics hat, of course, to the gym. Heretics dot com forward slash shop promo code cheers everything is 20 percent off we're talking about the second book in c.s lewis's space trilogy last week we did out of the silent planet which is the story of elwyn ransom's voyage to mars now we're talking about perilendra which is the name in old solar which is the space language or the heavenly language uh the name for venus and book two chronicles Ransom's voyage back into space uh, to visit Venus, which is what we might call a young world, meaning that new creation is just beginning on the world uh, in the form of rational life. We talked last week about the rational animal, uh, which which is man, but which in this story is also, you know, all the aliens that can use language, that can speak to one another, that can think. Um, and as we'll soon discover, post incarnation, that is post, you know, fall of man and uh, the coming of Christ to earth and the crucifixion of Jesus, um, Ransom learns that everything has changed in outer space, including that every rational animal now is shaped like a human being because God in the person of Christ, that is Maleldil in the old solar language, has, has taken on human form. And so now humans are going to be the race that populates the universe. The, the question on the table throughout Paralandra is can uh, Ransom, this kind of like shabby philologist, this uh, guy, Cambridge Don, who's sort of maybe based on J.R.R. Tolkien, um, although Tolkien protests against that. I think he also seems a lot like Lewis himself, um, but Lewis would certainly protest against that. And Lewis is himself a character in the novel. But either way, he's based on Lewis's set, right? This kind of shabby, uh, middle-aged college professor. Think of your typical tweedy, absent-minded academic who gets swept up into this cosmic battle and through it becomes ennobled um, and is placed in the role in this novel of uh, stopping a second fall. He's chased to Venus, to Paralandra by Weston, the evil Dr. Weston, who had in the first book been merely a kind of in inept colonizer of Mars, and in the second book um, becomes a conduit for Satan. It's a novel as much as anything about demonic possession, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, the uh, beautiful and terrifying portrayal that Lewis gives us of what it is like for a soul to give itself up in the here and now uh, to the, the forces of darkness, to the powers of evil. But crucially, and at the center, we're going to be talking about this woman. It turns out her name is Tinidril, although we don't learn that until later. And this uh, young woman, as in newly created woman, um, is faced with the same choice that Eve, our uh, common human mother, was faced with um, when she was tempted to eat the apple by the serpent, which was another sort of form of demonic possession or demonic uh, manifestation, right, in the in the book of Genesis. Um, Eve effectively in this novel, I'm going to again try to avoid as many spoilers as I can, but Tinidril does end up not doing the thing that is analogous to eating the apple. And so what we have here is a kind of allegory of the reversal of the fall. And that is why we are talking about it at Christmas time. This is our series of Christmas episodes. If you're watching me, you can see that I'm wearing a Santa hat. And the, 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 the point of talking about this novel now is to consider what it means for God to undo or more properly redeem the fall of man. So let's get into it. I want every Young Heretics listener to become a gajillionaire so that we can build our enormous empire of philosopher kings and queens, and that is why you've got to check out Truebill. Truebill will save you a 
ton of money. It's really easy to do because you probably don't even realize that you're bleeding money out of your bank account for subscriptions that you signed up for and then forgot about. You either do a free trial and then they just roll you over into the, you know, regular paid subscription, or maybe you just forget to cancel and now your ex is watching like, you know, 20 different romantic comedies on Netflix every night. Um, although I guess, you know, it would cost the same amount even if they weren't because these things just linger in your account. They draw money out. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. All Truebill does is goes through these accounts and cancels the ones that you're not using. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash heretics. One more time, it's Truebill.com slash heretics. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash heretics. I've already saved a bunch of money. They have testimonials from people who have saved a ridiculous amount, like, you know, 120 bucks a year on Sirius plus 650 a year on direct TV, um, 840 on car insurance. You just don't know what's lingering in there until you check it out. Truebill.com forward slash heretics to become fabulously wealthy and help build the young heretics empire. So I mentioned that this novel is kind of a, you know, an allegory of the new Eve. Tini Drill, this, this Venus woman, um, is the kind of object of a new uh, cosmic struggle over the fate of, of the rational animals. And in fact, Lewis dedicated the novel to a uh, community of St. Mary the Virgin. So obviously this question of, you know, the woman at the center of man's fate, either for good or evil, right? Eve, as through Eve comes the fall, so through Mary comes the birth of Christ, right? Um, this is this is all kind of standard uh, Anglican and Catholic theology. And he was meditating on this because when he wrote the first novel um, in the 1930s, 1939, Out of the Sign of the Planet comes out, he got this uh, very sort of positive Positive, uh, grateful letter from a woman at this community, the community of St. Mary the Virgin, um, and her name was Sister Penelope, and they developed this long correspondence, um, during which time Lewis says something to her, which is really beautiful, about the, the novels themselves and his whole career. He writes to Penelope, you will be both grieved and amused to learn that out of about 60 reviews, only two showed any knowledge that my idea of the fall of the bent one, which is what the space aliens or space angels call uh, Satan. The fall of the bent one was anything but a private invention of my own. But if only there were someone with a richer talent and more leisure, I believe this great ignorance might be a help to the evangelization of England. Any amount of theology can now be smuggled into people's minds under cover of romance without their knowing it. This is what I talked about last week when I said that in some ways what Lewis is doing here is he's showing you in a kind of new setting, um, defamiliarizing you with the Christian allegories, with Christian ethics, with Christian ideas and theology um, so that you see them as they are because you don't, you're not too familiar with them. One of the things I'm always talking about at Christmas time is the, these insane cosmic earth-shattering points of theology get delivered to us in a kind of comfy church setting and we think like, oh yes, like unto us a son is born, unto us a child is born. We've heard it a million times. And so it becomes more difficult, I think, for us to hear them freshly, to experience the truths in an alive kind of way. That's one reason why somebody might write a new translation of the same text. Um, but it's also a reason why somebody like Lewis or like Dante or, or like anybody might write an allegory or a mythic retelling of the Christmas story or of the Christian story more generally. Uh, Brecht, who was a kind of, uh, from a totally different context, a, a German Marxist, wrote about Verfremdungseffekt, which means literally like the, the making strange effect or the alienation effect, it's sometimes called, where you see something that's familiar to you, but in a totally new context or, you know, masked in a totally different way, and suddenly you realize what it is. That's kind of what Lewis is is doing here. And so he's, he's developing this idea as he's in correspondence with Sister Penelope, Community of St. Mary the Virgin. And this book is dedicated to some ladies at wantage, which is his covert way of saying is dedicated to this community of nuns. Um, and, and, and the whole book is concerned with this, the role of, of this woman and of, of womankind, so to speak, more generally, um, in, at, the, at the pivot of all humanity, this kind of crucial moment, um, this irrevocable moment where Tinidril will either decide to sleep on the fixed land or not. Instead of 
prohibiting man to eat an apple. Uh, on Venus, God has prohibited his new rational animals from sleeping on land that is fixed. They live on these kind of floating island things, um, and they enjoy that, and it's, pr it's paradise. I mean, it's beautiful. Everything tastes fantastic, um, but they're not supposed to go and, and sleep on the land that is not an island. It's just normal, you know, uh, continent like ours. Um, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because I've got to, you know, catch us up to how it is that Ransom gets back into space. He's been on Earth for a while. Lewis in the story, the character of C.S. Lewis, um, has been recording his his adventures and corresponding with him. And finally, uh, he's called Lewis's uh, to visit Ransom at a crucial moment. Now, remember that in this world, right, um, there are a lot of kind of fun Easter eggs for Lord of the Rings fans because this whole thing takes place in the same universe as Lord of the Rings. Like just the same way that, you know, Captain America and um, – Oh, uh, Doctor Strange live in the same Marvel universe. Um, the Space Trilogy and Lord of the Rings live in the same Inklings universe. And we know that for a number of reasons. One, because the fall of Numenor features in the third book, um, but also because these, there are these little hints dropped, um, like the fact that angels in the solar language in, in the Space Trilogy um, are called Eldila. The singular is, is Eldil. Um, and and this is uh, seems to be somehow derivative um, from the word for star in Kenya, which is one of the elvish languages in Lord of the Rings. So in Lord of the Rings, um, El or uh, sorry, Elen, um, and then the plural is LD means star. Um, and then these angel beings or these beings that dwell in the stars are called Eldila in Lord, in the space trilogy. Some really nerdy, you know, deep cut nerd stuff for you, but fun for thinking about how Lewis is constructing this entire history, this mythological history of the world and especially of England. So let's read a little bit about his uh, Lewis's, the character Lewis's first encounter um, with an Eldil, the Oyarsa of Mars, the, the angelic ruler of Mars. Um, the Oyarsa has been communicating with Ransom, telling him things directly from Melildil, directly from, from the second person of the Godhead. So Lewis is rummaging about in this dark house that, that Ransom has summoned him to. He says, I was just preparing to rise and hunt systematically round the room for a candle when I heard Ransom's name pronounced, and almost, but not quite, simultaneously, I saw the thing I had feared so long to see. I heard Ransom's name, name pronounced, but I should not like to say I heard a voice pronounce it. The sound was quite astonishingly unlike a voice. It was perfectly articulate. It was even, I suppose, rather beautiful. But it was, if you understand me, inorganic. We feel the difference between animal voices, including those of the human animal, and all other noises pretty clearly, I fancy, though it is hard to define. Blood and lungs and the warm, moist cavity of the mouth are somehow indicated in every voice. Here, they were not. The two syllables sounded more as if they were played on an instrument than as if they were spoken, and yet they did not sound mechanical either. A machine is something we make out of natural materials. This was more as if rock or crystal or light had spoken of itself, and it went through me from chest to groin like the thrill that goes through you when you think you have lost your hold while climbing a cliff. That was what I heard. What I saw was simply a very faint rod or pillar of light. I don't think it made a circle of light either on the floor or the ceiling, but I am not sure of this. It certainly had very little power of illuminating its surroundings, so far all is plain sailings. But it had two other characteristics which are less easy to grasp. One was its color. Since I saw the thing, I must obviously have seen it either white or colored, but no efforts of my memory can conjure up the faintest image of what color it was. I try blue and gold and violet and red, but none of them will fit. How it is possible to have a visual experience which immediately and ever after becomes impossible to remember, I do not attempt to explain. The other was its angle. It was not at right angles to the floor. But as soon as I have said this, I hasten to add that this way of putting it is a later reconstruction. What one actually felt at the moment was that the column of light was vertical, but the floor was not horizontal. The whole room seemed to have heeled over as if it were on board ship. The impression, however produced, was that the creature had reference to some horizontal, to some whole system of directions based outside Earth, and that its mere presence imposed that alien system on me and abolished the terrestrial horizontal. This is uh, part and parcel of Lewis's sort of running theme throughout his work, that 
angel life and heavenly life is actually more real than human life, not less. That we are kind of the pale reflections um, or recollections of, of what's really life. And that comes up again and again in this book. We're going to get into it in a bit. I'm going to read to you some other passages from his nonfiction, but here he represents it physically, and he gives us this wonderful kind of pseudo-scientific explanation in a footnote. Let me read on a little bit. He says, I had no doubt that I was seeing an Eldil, and little doubt that I was seeing the Archon of Mars, the Oyarsa of Malacandra. And now the, th the thing had happened, I was no longer in a condition of abject panic. My sensations were, it is true, in some ways very unpleasant. The fact that it was quite obviously not organic, the knowledge that intelligence was somehow located in this homogeneous cylinder of light, but not related to it as our consciousness is related to our brains and nerves, was profoundly disturbing. It would not fit into our categories. The response which we ordinarily make to a living creature and that which we make to an inanimate object were here both equally inappropriate. On the other hand, all those doubts which I had felt before I entered the cottage as to whether these creatures were friend or foe, and whether Ransom were a pioneer or a dupe, had for the moment vanished. My fear was now of another kind. I felt sure that the creature was what we call good, but I wasn't sure whether I liked goodness so much as I had supposed. This is a very terrible experience. As long as what you are afraid of is something evil, you may still hope that the good may come to your rescue. But suppose you struggle through to the good and find that it is also dreadful. How if food itself turns out to be the very thing you can't eat, and home the very place you can't live, and your very comforter the person who makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> this is Lewis's, I think, rather self-deprecating, but also kind of, you know, wry point about fallen humanity in relationship to angels. They are in orthogonal straightness. They, they live in the real kind of um, world, and we are askew in relation to them. Our hunt for goodness ends us up in a place where we might not actually like to be. Um, he gives us this little footnote um, from not... Vilkius, uh, who is a, a sort of made-up scientist from the 17th century. This is a Latinization of not wilk, which is uh, Anglo-Saxon for I know not who. Um, and that was Lewis's own pen name when he would write poetry. Sometimes he would publish it under NW, meaning just nobody knows who this is. Um, but he says, you know, I, I, in the text, I naturally keep to what is thought and felt at the time, since this alone is firsthand evidence. But there is obviously room for more further speculation about the form in which El Dila appeared to our senses. The only serious considerations of the problem so far are to be sought in the early 17th century. As a starting point for future investigation, I recommend the following from Nat Vilkius. It appears that the homogeneous flame perceived by our senses is not the body, properly so called, of an angel or demon, but rather the sensorium of that body, or the surface of a body which exists after a matter beyond our conception in the celestial flame frame of spatial references. So, okay, this is part of Lewis's effort, right? It's fictional, obviously, but what he's trying to do is to bridge this gap between um, philosophical and metaphysical speculation in the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, and even the ancient world, um, and our modern scientific abilities. And that's what makes these novels so urgent for the present moment, because we currently live, as I was talking about last week, in a thoroughly scientized world, which is to say a world that believes natural science is the only kind of knowledge that there is. And Lewis is suggesting that natural science might be telling us in physical and biological terms something which can only fully be described in mythological or theological terms. So he's trying to bridge this gap by, by sort of suggesting that if angels exist, they exist in a way that could be described on one level uh, by our physical science, um, but w it doesn't necessarily therefore follow that they would be directly available to our senses. They might exist on a plane of, of speed, for example, speeds beyond the speed of light or things that we, you know, can't possibly fathom. That's why the color of the angel is always something that you can't remember because the idea is it's, it's manipulating your brain to see the color spectrum that you can't currently see. We know there are colors we can't see. Um, the idea is here that like those colors can kind of come into being. And, and of course, we do know that things which are outside our frame of reference, outside our, you know, our, the structure of our brain would actually be invisible to us. So he's doing something very sly here that will come back to haunt us in a bit. Um, but let's get into the, the, the journey because what, what uh, the Oyarsa does is he sends Ransom off to Venus um, on, a, on a mission from Maleldil, but nobody knows what the mission is. Is. Nobody in the book, at least. We don't know what the mission is. Um, and, and so he's arrived on this planet. It turns out basically to be deserted, except he then discovers this, this one woman who turns out to be part of a pair, the first couple on Venus. Let me read to you a little bit from their uh, first interaction. 
Now, as we all know, if I could deliver this podcast entirely in ancient Greek or Latin, I would, but I can't. Why? Because y'all don't speak ancient Greek and Latin, all of you. If you want to, and you should, go to the Ancient Language Institute. There is no better way to get up close and personal with the texts of Western culture, with the great literature that we talk about on this show, and to go to Ancient Language Institute and learn to read them in their original languages. It's like a face-to-face -face encounter with somebody from 2,000 years ago or more. And it's there's really no other way to do that. It's like magic. ALI is great because they get you reading quickly. They treat it a little bit like a living language, um, and they don't set up all these barriers where we have to memorize a million grammar rules before you start reading. You can dive right into Aristotle, the Bible, Cicero, um, all of these wonderful authors that we talk about all the time on this show. When you go to ancientlanguage.com forward slash heretics, ancientlanguage.com forward slash heretics, you get a 10% discount on tuition with the promo code heretics. Start reading the Bible in its original languages, the great Athenian philosophers, the golden age of poetry of Rome, and more. Ancientlanguage.com forward slash heretics, promo code heretics. You don't need a PhD. You can be at any level um, for yourself or for the students in your life. This is an excellent way to get to know the great works of the West. So remember that they're floating on these little islands in the sea that kind of rock and float almost like froth on top of the ocean. Um, and he sees her from afar and she laughs at him. This is the first thing that happens. She points and laughs. And then finally he manages to make his way to her. And here's their interaction. I was young yesterday, she began, but he did not hear the rest of her speech. The meeting, now that it had actually come about, proved overwhelming. You must not misunderstand the story at this point. What overwhelmed him was not in the least the fact that she, like himself, was totally naked. Embarrassment and desire were both a thousand miles away from this experience, and if he was a little ashamed of his own body, that was a shame which had nothing to do with difference of sex and turned only on the fact that he knew his body to be a little ugly and a little ridiculous. Still less was her color a source of horror to him. She's green, I forgot to mention. The, the, the people on, on Venus are green. In her own world, that green was beautiful and fitting. It was his pasty white and angry sunburn which were the monstrosity. It was neither of these, but he found himself unnerved. He had to ask her presently to repeat what she had been saying. I was young yesterday, she said, when I laughed at you. Now I know that people in your world do not like to be laughed at. You say you were young, asks Ransom. Yes, she says. Are you not young today also? She appeared to be thinking for a few moments, so intently that the flowers dropped unregarded from her hand. I see it now, she said presently. It is very strange to say one is young at the moment one is speaking. But tomorrow I shall be older, and then I shall say I was young today. You are quite right. This is great wisdom you are bringing, O oh, piebald man. She calls him piebald, which means like uh, mottled or speckled because he's half sunburned and half uh, white. O oh, piebald man. And she, he says, what do you mean? This looking backward and forward along the line and seeing how a day has one appearance as it comes to you and another when you are in it and a third when it has gone past, like the waves. But you are very little older than yesterday. How do you know that? I mean, said Ransom, a night is not a very long time. She thought again, and then spoke suddenly, her face lightening. I see it now, she said. You think times have lengths. A night is always a night, whatever you do in it. As from this tree to that is always so many paces, whether you take them quickly or slowly. I suppose that is true in a way, but the waves do not always come at equal distances. I see that you come from a wise world, if this is wise. I have never done it before. Stepping out of life, into the alongside, and looking at oneself, living, as if one were not alive. Do they all do that in your world, piebald? And so this is, again, picking up a theme that will be throughout the whole trilogy, this idea that time and perception and memory are, are actually truer from the human subjective point of view than from the cold analytic scientific point of view, which is always a construct, right? That too, we always observe things in a scientific way and we make notes and measures and we try to create, you know, objective lines of, you know, this started here and ended here, it was this many paces. Um, and yet that doesn't tell us everything about an event. If I tell you that I walked, you know, five 
feet. Um, it doesn't tell you everything because I, it doesn't tell you what I was waiting to experience on the other end of that walk. And that might have made the walk feel very long or very short. Maybe I walked five feet to greet my lover. And then I was, you know, it, it felt like forever. It took me forever to get there. Maybe I was walking to my execution and it felt like it was going past way too quickly. Right. Um, so, so Tanidra lives in this world, this rich world of human experience. Um, and so in that sense, she is kind of childlike in, uh, in the sense of, you know, there are, there are ways of thinking about the world that she's learning. And she thinks of that as getting older, the more that she learns. Um, but in another sense, she's not childlike as we picture Adam and Eve at all. Here I'm going to read you another passage from Lewis's preface to Paradise Lost, in which he describes how Adam and Eve, uh, although they are innocent in, in one sense, that is, they don't have our, you know, our sin and death and evil, um, that doesn't actually make them dumber than us or even more primitive than us. Quite the opposite. Our sin, our death, our evil drags us down. Um, here's, here's his passage on this. So Lewis is describing his, his first reading and then his later readings of Paradise Lost. He says, I had come to the poem associating innocence with childishness. I had also an evolutionary background which led me to think of early men and therefore a fortiori of the first men as savages. The beauty I expected in Adam and Eve was that of the primitive, the unsophisticated, the naive. I had hoped to be shown their inarticulate delight in a new world which they were spelling out letter by letter to hear them prattle. Not to put too fine a point on it, I wanted an Adam and Eve whom I could patronize, and when Milton made it clear that I was not allowed to do anything of the sort, I was repelled. <laughs> These expectations of mine were due to my refusal to suspend my disbelief, to take seriously, at least till I had finished the poem, the assumptions on which it is based. Raleigh's reference to Adam's inexperience is misleading. The whole point about Adam and Eve is that, as they would never, but for sin, have been old, so they were never young, never immature or underdeveloped. They were created full-grown and perfect. Mr. Binion understands the right approach much better than Raleigh, and when he makes his dying Adam say to his sons, this is a poem, The Death of, Al, uh, the Death of Adam, that he's quoting from, These hands in paradise have gathered flowers. These limbs, which you have seen so wasted down in feebleness, so utterly brought low, they grew not into stature like your limbs. I wailed not into this great world a child, helpless and speechless, understanding not, but from God's rapture, perfect and full-grown, I suddenly awoke out of the dark. Adam was, from the first, a man in knowledge as well as in stature. He alone of all men has been in Eden in the garden of God. He has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He was endowed, says Athanasius, with a vision of God so far reaching that he could contemplate the eternity of the divine essence and the cosmic operations of his word. He was a heavenly being, according to St. Ambrose, who breathed the ether and was accustomed to converse with God face to face. His mental powers, says St. Augustine, surpassed those of the most brilliant philosopher, as much as the speed of a bird surpasses that of a tortoise. If such a being had existed, and we must assume that he did before we can read the poem, then Professor Raleigh and still more myself, on being presented to him, would have had a rude shock. It is we who would have been the stammering boys, shifting uneasily from one foot to the other, red in the face, and hoping that our clownishness would be excused by our ignorance. So Lewis is here citing a number of church fathers um, and English poets as a, as a way of getting at this theological truth that we have forgotten because we have modern assumptions that have nothing to do with the Bible and nothing to do with, the, with theology and everything to do with our idea that, you know, later is better, right? That time progresses and progress, progression is always good and the further forward you go, the better you get. The opposite is the case when it comes to Eden and to, you know, true Christian theology, right? That actually we are the ones who have fallen, who have been reduced um, and who have, you know, less access to the truth. So he's getting at that in this in this preface to Milton's Paradise Lost, and he's showing it to you in the character of Tenidril and, and her encounter with Ransom. It's a beautiful il illustration of what I'm always yammering on about, that art shows you things in an emotional and experiential way um, that you can learn about in other ways, but that don't hit you quite the same way uh, when they're dramatized or narrativized. Um, so what happens next? Well, we proceed, right... Well, we, we proceed to discover that Weston has come to this world as well. Ransom has been sent there by the angels. Weston has his own spaceship that he's been, you know, trying to create so he can go out into the world and conquer the solar system and then beyond the whole universe. So what Ransom wants is for the sheer force of life, um, which is to say power and strength uh, to dominate throughout the whole universe. That means colonizing the world with human beings and making out of human beings a kind of post-human uh, triumph, something 
something in his view that would be better than everything else, which we've learned already is basically a satanic idea that just, you know, if we just uh, maximize our strength, our reach, our longevity at the expense of everything else, our our virtue doesn't matter, our humanity doesn't matter, all that matters is strength, right? Um, Weston is basically trying to push this view out into the world beyond the barriers of Earth, because Earth, of course, is encircled by the domain of Satan, which, which comes into being at the fall. Now Weston is going to be the agent of trying to bring that fall onto this planet. Um, but when we meet him, he has made a kind of philosophical adjustment, which is really interesting. Um, he's kind of developed himself as a character. Um, and, and this is going to be crucial not only for this book, but for the next one, for uh, that hideous strength, which is going to be about basically Weston's philosophy and Satan's use of it in the world. So, so here's Weston. He says to Ransom, I mean that all my life I had been making a wholly unscientific dichotomy or antithesis between man and nature, had conceived myself fighting for man against his non-human environment. During my illness, I plunged into biology, and particularly into what may be called biological philosophy. Hitherto, as a physicist, I had been content to regard life as a subject outside my scope, the conflicting views of those who drew a sharp line between the inorganic and the organic, and those who held that what we call life was inherent in matter from the very beginning, had not interested me. Now it did. I saw almost at once that I could admit no break, no discontinuity, in the unfolding of the cosmic process. I became a convinced believer in emergent evolution. All is one. The stuff of mind, the unconsciously purposive dynamism, is present from the very beginning. Here he paused. Ransom had heard this sort of thing pretty often before, and wondered when his companion was coming to the point. When Weston resumed, it was with an even deeper solemnity of tone. The majestic spectacle of this blind, inarticulate purposiveness, thrusting its way upward and ever upward in an endless unity of differentiated achievements towards an ever-increasing complexity of organization, towards spontaneity and spirituality, swept away all my old conception of a duty to man as such. Man in himself is nothing. The forward movements of life, the growing spirituality, is everything. I say to you quite freely, Ransom, that I should have been wrong in liquidating the Malachandrians. It was a mere prejudice that made me prefer our own race to theirs. To spread spirituality, not to spread the human race, is henceforth my mission. This sets the coping stone on my career. I worked first for myself, then for science, then for humanity, but now at last for spirit itself. I might say, borrowing language, which will be more familiar to you, the Holy Spirit. Now, what exactly do you mean by that? Asked Ransom. I mean, said Weston, that nothing now divides you and me except a few outworn theological technicalities with which organized religion has unhappily allowed itself to get encrusted. But I have penetrated that crust. The meaning beneath it is as true and living as ever. If you will excuse me for putting it that way, the essential truth of the religious view of life finds a remarkable witness in the fact that it enabled you, on Malachandra, to grasp, in your own mythical and imaginative fashion, a truth which was hidden from me. I don't know much about what people call the religious view of life, said Ransom, wrinkling his brow. You see, I'm a Christian, and what we mean by the Holy Ghost is not a blind, inarticulate purposiveness. Now, this is a, the, the wonderful thing about this is that it comes with a certain pseudo-spirituality, um, which also obtains even in our most materialist scientific views. Because, of course, you know, when, when materialists, that is people who believe there's only matter in the world, present their views, um, they usually have to coat them in some sort of conventional morality. But where do you get conventional morality? Where do you get thou shalt not kill, um, except from some form of tradition or, or indeed religion, some, you know, theistic idea that there is absolute good in the world? Well, usually they'll kind of try to smuggle it in that this is, you know, for our for our survival and our mutual benefit and cooperation. Um, but of course, there's that's mere prejudice, right? If you actually, it's just a prejudice to say that man should continue to live um, at the expense of other animals, at the expense of plants, unless you think that mankind, rationality, and individual human consciousness um, has some special place in a divinely ordered cosmos. And so Weston doesn't believe that, which means that he's basically learned that the implication of his own belief um, in strength, in, in, you know, in, in life uh, at all, at the expense of everything else, um, is that man doesn't really matter at all. And all he needs to do is just exert his will on the world um, forever until, you know, life and spirituality and some vague abstract sense uh, can flourish and come into being. Lewis 
rejected this view, obviously. Um, but one of the ways that he, he repelled it throughout his life is by insisting on the personal nature, not only of the deity, but of humanity, that actually these, uh, you know, sort of vague abstractions which we have are just smuggling in other ideas. This is a profound fact about language in general, that actually when we abstract things away, um, we talk about them in muddier terms rather than clearer terms half the time. So if we say, for example, that God is spirit, we think that what we've done is, is made of him some kind of airy phantom in the, in the air that is just breath or something. But of course, spirit means literal breath, right? It means a kind of, um, a kind of wind or, or motion in the world. Um, and in, in the Bible, especially the older passages, um, these two things are united. The, the, the physical movements of God in the world and the spiritual higher realities are, are as one. They're like two sides of the same coin. Um, if you really want to get into this, then not only Aristotle, but also uh, Lewis's friend and colleague Owen Barfield writes this book, Poetic Diction, um, about the fact that in primitive human consciousness, there isn't this sort of neat dividing line between some sort of disembodied abstraction and, and embodied humanity. It's very different than saying, physical life is the only thing that there is. Matter is the only thing that there is. Um, but the opposite extreme is to say there is something called mind um, that exists completely separate and distinct um, from all matter. Um, what, what the sort of middle ground here that Lewis is trying to trot is to say there do exist eternal things, love, uh, goodness, truth, right? But they're always present in or made, you know, made real in their, you know, inhabiting of the physical world. And so he's essentially saying that unless you, you know, believe in your brother, unless you love your brother whom you have seen, you cannot love God whom you have not seen and whom you are only thinking of as some kind of vague, you know, floating gas uh, in, in the world. And he says that's actually a less accurate idea of God because as we said, the heavenly reality is, if anything, more concrete and more real than the earthly reality. So here's a passage from his, his book, Miracles, um, which sort of describes this uh, at, at some length. He says, men are reluctant. This is Lewis again, but now in his nonfiction mode. Men are reluctant to pass over from the notion of an abstract and negative deity to the living God. I do not wonder. Here lies the deepest taproot of pantheism and the objection to traditional imagery. It was hated not at bottom because it pictured him, that is God, as man, but because it pictured him as king or even as warrior. The pantheist God does nothing, demands nothing. He is there, if you wish, for him, like a book on a shelf. He will not pursue you. There is no danger that at any time heaven and earth should flee away at his glance. If he were the truth, then we could really say that all the Christian images of kingship were a historical accident of which our religion ought to be cleansed. It is with a shock that we discover them to be indispensable. You have had a shock like that before in connection with smaller matters, when the line pulls at your hand, when something breathes beside you in the darkness. So here, the shock comes at the precise moment when the thrill of life is communicated to to us along the clue we have been following. It is always shocking to meet life where we thought we were alone. Look out, we cry. It's alive. And therefore, this is the very point at which so many draw back. I would have done so myself if I could and proceed no further with Christianity. An impersonal God, well and good. A subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside our own heads, better still. A formless life force surging through us. A vast power which we can tap best of all. But God himself, alive, pulling at the other end of the cord, perhaps approaching at an infinite speed, the hunter, king, husband, that is quite another matter. There comes a moment when the children who have been playing at burglars hush suddenly. Was that a real footstep in the hall? There comes a moment when people who have been dabbling in religion, quote, man's search for God, suddenly draw back, supposing we really found him. We never meant it to come to that. Worse still, supposing he had found us. It's a beautiful passage, and it perfectly articulates what Weston is doing. He's indulging in this speculative fantasy about life as, as a force that pervades the whole universe, because what he really wants to do is harness it, right? He wants to, you know, make spaceships and go out into the world. Not itself a bad motive, but not the only motive. And so by reducing him to only this, um, Satan effectively takes hold of his body. This is where the demonic possession begins, um, and Weston becomes what is called throughout the book the unman. It's a kind of horrifying idea 
idea um, of this body of in which the human soul has been, we'll, we'll learn later, sort of decapitated and suppressed and scattered. Um, and the real consciousness that's operating is the satanic consciousness. I said before that this is now turning into an analog, a, a, a space station analog um, to the, uh, the temptation of Eve in the garden. There too, Satan enters into the body of another, of the serpent, um, and tries to tempt Eve. Eve falls. Here, there is a, a body, Weston's body, that is taken over by Satan. There's an Eve in the person of Tinidril, and there's this third person, which is Ransom. Um, suddenly, there's this character that's trying, basically, to avert the fall by arguing and fighting with Satan. So that's the, you know, the core crux of the book. Um, first, before we get into it, let me read the passage from Genesis in which Eve actually does fall. This is Genesis 3, um, so we'll have that in our minds as we're reading the rest of, of Paralandra. My dudes, I want you to make sure you're looking your best, and that is why I think you should check out Disco. Guys don't think about skincare. They think of it as kind of a girl thing, um, and that's probably why so many of us look like junk. <laughs> it's not girly to care what you look like, um, and, and women like it, which is even more important. So when you go to Disco, you can get a starter set um, of incredibly simple and convenient skincare products. The face cleanser stick fights acne and oily skin. The exfoliating face scrub prevents razor burn and ingrown hairs. Plus, it feels really nice. I really like that one. The hydrating face moisturizer hydrates your skin and prevents wrinkles. I also particularly like they have this stick that you can just rub on under your eyes and it gets rid of the dark circles. Very, very helpful. Um, I get those all the time because I you know, don't always get as much sleep as I should. If you want to check out Disco and try their incredible skincare products for yourself, we have a special offer for the Young Heretics audience. Go to letsdisco.com and enter heretics at checkout for 30% off your first order. That's letsdisco.com with code heretics for 30% off your first order. That's a huge discount and the stuff isn't super pricey already. So it's a great discount, um, and you got to be looking your best. I mean, come on, pull yourself together, man. <laughs> Let's just go dot com. Enter heretics at checkout for a 30% discount. So here's Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of any tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, Of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. It's very short six verses, um, very short passage that contains within it the seeds of all the rest of this book that we're going to read, because it has this kind of very subtle interaction between the serpent and Eve, right? Serpent as Satan always does, telling a half-truth. That is to say, you won't die on that day that you eat. Um, but, of course, you surely shall die when you eat. Um, again, God doesn't want you to be like God in the sense of judging the good and evil of the universe. We've talked about what this might mean before. Um, but surely it doesn't mean that God doesn't want mankind to reach his full fruition. right? So this is this kind of leaving things out, telling half-truths. Um, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes, to be desired to make one wise. So she she wants to become wise. She sees the beauty of it. She, she you know, she sees the, the physical attraction of it and the spiritual attractions of it, again, are as one, right? The, it's just a delight to the eyes. It looks juicy and good. And she thinks that what it will do for her is also good. Um, my producer, Jonathan Hay, has just pointed out to me that there's no mention in the Bible that Adam and Eve are separated here. Um, in later retellings, like in Paradise Lost, they do separate. Eve asks Adam to go off and work on her own, which she does, um, and then she's kind of accosted alone. And we usually imagine Eve accosted alone. Um, but perhaps Adam was there. I mean, she turns, seems to just turn and, and give it to the um, to to her husband next to her. We don't actually know in the Bible, but in Paralandra, Lewis creates this situation where there kind of is another Adam, although the actual new Adam, Tor, is off somewhere else. So he seems to have imagined that the, the couple, you know, the, the first couple is split up, um, but he puts Ransom there as a kind of counterweight or counterbalance, and they enter into this very, very long uh, set of philosophical arguments about whether or not Tinidril should sleep on the land, which is really just a rehash in some ways of the arguments over whether Eve should eat the apple or not. Um, 
I'm going to leave some of that to your uh, later reading because, as I said, I don't want to spoil the entire thing. I'm going to try from here on not to spoil everything that happens in the book. Um, but I do want to read to you one passage that I found particularly important um, because, of course, this debate goes on much longer than the one in Genesis, um, in part because Satan keeps trying again and again and again. And one of the things he does is he talks to her in her sleep. Um, and I'm going to read that passage to you because I think it's important. So here's Lewis writes, Sleep proved to be indeed the problem. For what seemed a great time, cramped and wearied, and soon hungry and thirsty as well, he sat still in the darkness, trying not to untend the unflagging repetition of ransom, ransom, ransom. The, the, one of the things that Satan does through Weston is at night he just says ransom's name over and over again like a schoolboy taunting somebody. Um, and the, one part of the picture of Satan here is that he's, every form of evil is acceptable to him. Any kind of harm he might cause from just sheer annoyance all the way down to, you know, malevolent, you know, digestion of souls into his greasy maw um, is all one to him. He just wants pain, right? Um, so, presently, Ransom found himself listening to a conversation of which he knew he had not heard the beginning and realized that he had slept. The lady seemed to be saying very little. Weston's voice was speaking gently and continuously. It was not talking about the fixed land, nor even about Maleldiel. It appeared to be telling with extreme beauty and pathos a number of stories, and at first Ransom could not perceive any connecting link between them. They were all about women, but women who had apparently lived at different periods of the world's history and in quite different circumstances. From the lady's replies, it appeared that the stories contained much that she did not understand, but oddly enough, the unman did not mind. If the questions aroused by any one story proved at all difficult to answer, the speaker simply dropped that story and instantly began another. The heroines of the stories seemed all to have suffered a great deal. They had been oppressed by fathers, cast off by husbands, deserted by lovers. Their children had risen up against them and society had driven them out. But the stories all ended in a sense happily, sometimes with honors and praises to a heroine still living, more often with tardy acknowledgement and unavailing tears after her death. As the endless speech proceeded, the lady's questions grew always fewer, some meaning for the words death and sorrow, though what kind of meaning Ransom could not even guess, was apparently being created in her mind by mere repetition. At last it dawned upon him what all these stories were about. Each one of these women had stood forth alone and braved a terrible risk for her child, her lover, or her people. Each had been misunderstood, reviled, and persecuted, but each also magnificently vindicated by the event. The precise details were often not very easy to follow. Ransom had more than a suspicion that many of these noble pioneers had been what in ordinary terrestrial speech we call witches or perverts, but that was all in the background. What emerges from the stories was rather an image than an idea, the picture of the tall, slender form, unbowed through the world's weight, though the world's weight rested upon its shoulders, stepping forth fearless and friendless into the dark to do for others what those others forbade it to do, yet needed to have done. And all the time, as a sort of background to these goddess shapes, the speaker was building up a picture of the other sex. No word was directly spoken on the subject, but one felt them there as a huge, dim multitude of creatures pitifully childish and complacently arrogant, timid, meticulous, unoriginating, sluggish and ox-like, rooted to the earth almost in their indolence, prepared to try nothing, to risk nothing, to make no exertion, and capable of being raised into full life only by the unthanked and rebellious virtue of their females. It was very well done. This is a beautiful imagining of how the devil might get into you in ways beyond your logic. He's whispering dreams, essentially, into her ear that are all half understood, but which create this cloudy picture, which if we really looked at it, we would instantly realize is, is false, but which is only kind of in the background, right? This picture of, of woman alone, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of, I, I think, prescient that, that this is how he would depict Satan enticing women away from, you know, from real virtue, from real excellence, from an actual chance to have a, you know, cosmic effect on the world. If she just resists here, she will in fact be, uh, in some sense, an agent of humanity's flourishing and salvation. Um, she will be the mother of all humanity. Um, but he's, you know, Satan is producing in her head this image that what really counts um, is sort of, you know, noble disobedience against 
against the world, right? Everybody is against you. And what you have to do is strike forth um, and, and, you know, and crash through the barriers. We might say break the glass ceiling, right? This idea that, you know, bad women, uh, you know, well-behaved women rarely make history is a slogan you'll hear a lot of the time. Um, and of course, this is irrelevant. <laughs> you can make history for being a, a scoundrel just as easily as you can make history uh, for, for being virtuous. And plenty of women who do, in fact, the virtuous and good things, um, either in obedience to their husbands or in uh, communion with their husbands, um, have had cosmic effects upon history. We're going to talk about one in just a second, namely Mary, <laughs> namely the Virgin Mary, um, whose whole act is an act of obedience. Sarah is another one. I mean, the biblical history is, of course, full of these examples. Um, but, you know, we have this idea now that in order to be really great, what women have to do is, you know, strike out um, on some grand adventure against the evils of men, against the patriarchy, right? That's all it's all in this. It's basically Satan is saying rebel against the patriarchy. Um, even if the patriarchy is telling you to do something that's going to make you joyous and fulfilled and happy, right? Even if, and we, and we do this to women all the time now. I mean, even if motherhood and homemaking is something that fulfills and brings joy to many women, the majority even of women, um, we still, you know, deride it as if they also, they're not full people unless they, you know, compete in the economy, unless they're girl bosses, unless they have careers. Um, and this drives me nuts, of course, because there's, there's nothing more honorable for a woman to do than to to become the mother of souls, right? The shaper of souls in the nursery. Um, and we deride this, you know, even I think in some conservative circles, we don't think of this as, you know, a position of honor equivalent to being a CEO. Um, it, we, we talk as if CEOs and, and, you know, manly accomplishments were the only things that could really give anybody any worth or value in the world. Um, and, and this makes women miserable because then they feel that they have to, you know, do this Thing, in order to be worthwhile, they have to do this thing that they really don't want to do. Um, and instead, you know, what we should be focusing on is creating the world in which women can do that, right? The whole point of manly endeavor is to create a world in which women can raise their children, can stay home, can delight in things. And it doesn't mean that women need to be, you know, barefoot and pregnant all the time and never work. Of course, you know, we, we have a wonderful world where women can use digital technology to do all sorts of work from home and stuff. But the fundamental idea here is, right, what is worthwhile? What do we value and honor? And Satan is creating this, this world in which we only value transgression, right? That's his favorite thing to do. We only value breaking free of the patriarchy. And Lewis is trying to impress upon, or Ransom rather, uh, is trying to impress upon this woman that in fact, all honor and glory and excellence lies right here <laughs> with obedience to God, right? Um, of course, this is the, the debate and the struggle that we have with ourselves all the time. It goes on forever. And this is where the novel takes a kind of interesting turn because eventually Ransom just thinks this can't go on. You know, Satan won't stop. Even when he loses, he just starts back up again, uh, picks up the argument, lies more. Um, and finally, Ransom thinks this, you know, this just can't go on. So he retreats sort of to, to think about himself. And, and here is what he comes up with. So first, he's trying to think if there's some way that he can get out of this duty, which just seems impossibly hard. His, his mind darted hopefully down a side alley that seemed to promise escape. Very well, then. He had been brought here miraculously. He was in God's hands. As long as he did his best, and he had done his best, God would see to the final issue. He had not succeeded, but he had done his best. It snapped like a violin string. Not one rag of all this evasion was left. Relentlessly, unmistakably, the darkness pressed down upon him the knowledge that this picture of the situation was utterly false. His journey to Paralandra was not a moral exercise, nor a sham fight. If the issue lay in Malelil's hands, Ransom and the lady were those hands. The fate of a world really depended on how they behaved in the next few hours. The thing was irreducibly, nakedly real. They could, if they chose, decline to save the innocence of this new race, and if they declined, its innocence would not be saved. It rested with no other creature in all time or all space. This he saw clearly, though as yet he had no inkling of what he could do. The voluble self protested, wildly, swiftly, like the propeller of a ship, racing when it is out of the water. The imprudence, the unfairness, the absurdity of it. Did Maleldiel want to lose worlds? What was the sense of so arranging things that anything really important should finally and absolutely depend on such a man of straw as himself? And at that moment, 
far away on earth, as he now could not help remembering, men were at war, and white-faced subalterns and freckled corporals who had but lately begun to shave stood in horrible gaps or crawled forward in deadly darkness, awaking, like him, to the preposterous truth that all really depended on their actions. And far away in time, Horatius stood on the bridge, and Constantine settled in his mind whether he would or would not embrace the new religion, and Eve herself stood looking upon the forbidden fruit and the heaven of heavens waited for her decision. He writhed and ground his teeth, but could not help seeing. Thus and not otherwise the world was made. Either something or nothing must depend on individual choices, and if something, who could set bounds to it? A stone may determine the course of a river. He was that stone at this horrible moment, which had become the center of the whole universe, the Eldila of all worlds, the sinless organisms of everlasting light were silent in deep heaven to see what Elwyn Ransom of Cambridge would do. It's phenomenal, and it's a, it's, it's a sort of subtle antidote, antithesis to the Western, the satanic view of things, right? That all is impersonal life force. Um, God effectively says he values you enough that your choices have real and actual consequence. Doesn't mean he won't you know, step in and forgive if you make mistakes doesn't mean that you're going to always get the right answer. It just means that the things that you are choosing about, the, the questions that you are asking yourself today, what will I say at my child's school board? How will I treat my husband or my wife? Um, where am I going to go to work? Where am I going to live? Um, will I go to war for my country? All of these questions are real questions that have cosmic cosmic proportions. And so either you don't matter at all, or you matter on that level. And Lewis is saying you matter. Unfortunately, we are afraid to tell you on that level. What happens next is that he realizes he just has to beat the devil up. <laughs> and this is, I, I, I both love this and find it a little bit disappointing. Um, you can write to me and tell me I'm wrong about this, but I, I sort of feel as if at this point, the, the story gets interrupted and resolved, you know, by, by violence. And the point is great for Ransom. As a point for Ransom, it's perfect. It's like, you know, you just have to do something and the decisiveness of it is excellent. He's, he has to go and fight the devil and that's what he does. For Tenidril, for Eve, it strikes me as a little bit disappointing just because she never actually makes a final choice. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the alternative story, which is the story of Mary, where she does make a redemptive choice that kind of, um, you know, transforms the fall of Adam and Eve. But this, that's for another day. What happens next is that Ransom and the devil get into this big fight. And finally, finally, the consciousness of Weston reemerges from whatever deep it's been in. I want to read that passage too, just because it's, it's part of this, you know, horrifying depiction of hell that Lewis is painting. So this is the voice that comes up that seems like Weston's voice from the body. He says, don't be angry. There's no good being angry with me. I thought you might be sorry. My God, Ransom, it's awful. You don't understand. Right down under layers and layers, buried alive. You try to connect things and can't. They take your head off, and you can't even look back on what life was like because you know it never did mean anything, even from the beginning. In this small passage, he's dramatizing another big idea of his, um, which we get in the problem of pain. We've talked uh, previously, when we talked about conscience, we also talked about consciousness uh, as a kind of self-awareness, that in fact, being self-aware means not just that you have one experience after another after another, but that you have memory of those experience and, and awareness of yourself as a thing that's having all these experiences. Let's say I, I'm feeling really happy, and then something gets me down, and I am suddenly plunge into sorrow. Um, there's still an odd that persists through sorrow and joy, right? Whatever I'm feeling, I still have a consciousness which looks at itself in some ways. It's the sense that is aware of itself, as Aristotle points out. Um, and, and this is our soul. Our soul is the thing that makes us a continuous identity throughout time. And, and Lewis says, is speculating that perhaps the annihilation of the soul is the annihilation just of that self-awareness or that consciousness. He says, Destruction, we should naturally assume, means the unmaking or cessation of the destroyed. And people often talk as if the annihilation of a soul were intrinsically possible. In all our experience, however, the destruction of one thing means the emergence of something else. Burn a log, and you have gases, heat, and ash. To have been a log now means being those three things. If a soul can be destroyed, must there not be a state of having been a human soul? And is not that perhaps the state which is equally well described as torment, destruction, and privation? 
You will remember that in the parable, the saved go to a place prepared for them, while the damned go to a place never made for men at all. To enter heaven is to become more human than you ever succeeded being in earth. To enter hell is to be banished from humanity. What is cast or casts itself into hell is not a man, it is remains. To be a complete man means to have the passions obedient to the will and the will offered to God. To have been a man, to be an ex-man or a damned ghost, would presumably mean to consist of a will utterly centered in itself and passions utterly uncontrolled by the will. It is, of course, impossible to imagine what the consciousness of such a creature, already a loose conjuries of mutually antagonistic sins rather than a sinner, would be like. There may be a truth in the saying that hell is hell not from its own point of view, but from the heavenly point of view. I do not think this belies the severity of our Lord's words. It is only to the damned that their fate could ever seem less than unendurable. And it must be admitted that as in these last chapters we think of eternity, the categories of pain and pleasure which have engaged us so long begin to recede as vaster good and evil looms in sight. Neither pain nor pleasure as such has the last word. Even if it were possible that the experience, if it can be called experience of the lost contained no pain and much pleasure, still that black pleasure would be such as to send any soul not already damned flying to its prayers in nightmare terror. Even if there were pains in heaven, all who understand would desire them. And so this is Lewis's essentially spec, I mean, it's speculation, of course, but it's all, this is all speculation. This is all kind of imaginative uh, creation or imagination of what might be um, in the cosmic level or plane that we can't contemplate, that we can't directly see. All we can do is tell mythological stories to express it, to guess at it, uh, to see it, as Paul says, through a glass darkly. Um, and so I'm going to read one final passage from the kind of resolution of all this, again, trying to be a little bit vague about what happens in the very end. Um, but as the, the thing concludes, we reach this kind of beatific vision of, of, all, co of all the cosmos. Um, and, and here is the crucial passage. Essentially, the conclusion of this drama uh, looks back on the fall of man as the beginning of all things and the redemption of man as the kind of first step uh, toward the redemption of all the world. Um, and the idea is not that this is some, you know, recreation of the Adam and Eve story again, um, but that everything is changed with the incarnation so that now Ransom has to fight the devil, right? Um, and this this new role for humanity, for redeemed humanity um, in the redemption of other races becomes a meditation simply on the nature of, of the creation in general. Is is the world, is one event more important than another? No, because Maleldil is at the center of all. So here they say, um, the peoples of the ancient worlds who never sinned, for whom he never came down, are the peoples for whose sake the low worlds were made. For though the healing what was wounded and the straightening what was bent is a new dimension of glory, yet the straight was not made that it might be bent, nor the whole that it might be wounded. The ancient peoples are at the center. Blessed be he. All which is not itself the great dance was made in order that he might come down into it. In the fallen world, he prepared for himself a body and was united with the dust and made it glorious forever. This is the end and final cause of all creating, and the sin whereby it came is called fortunate, and the world where this was enacted is the center of worlds. Blessed be he. That sense that your choice today has cosmic and utter significance is your intuition that you are a creature that was made to do God's will. And this is something that, you know, we, we lose because we have this grand abstracted theory of the universe. But when we look back into the actual events that make up that theory, we find that they're just individual human choices. Ransom's choice to fight against the devil, to Nidril's choice whether or not to sleep on the fixed lands, the choice of young men to go out and fight for their country in World War II, the choice of you to fight on behalf of your country in the school board, in your local government, at home, wherever, right? This, these, these minute moments that you choose look ordinary, but they only look ordinary because the ordinary is at every moment imbued with the entirety of God. As we are meditating on this at the beginning of the Christmas season, I'm going to read to you to close out one last passage about one last human choice that changed the world. The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. 
And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom, then there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. The straightening of what was bent is for the glory of God, but what was straight was not meant to be bent. If there is in real life another Eve who makes the right choice where Eve made the wrong one, it is Mary, and here she is making that choice. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Merry Christmas. I hope this has helped you see it anew and in new light, for it is eternally new, and it is always with you. You don't need me to tell you that American education is broken, but you do need me to tell you about the Albertus Magnus Institute. I love these guys. They are providing real alternatives uh, to woke education. Um, you don't get all the nonsense that you might get. Plus, you're not going to pay $200,000 uh, as Rashida Tlaib did for her apparently useless education. Sorry, I didn't say that. Um, but no, I did say that. I mean, you can get a free fellowship at magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. All the courses in this fellowship are live, online, and interactive. And most importantly, they deal with the important stuff, the good stuff that we talk about on this show, the true, the good, and the beautiful, how to seek it, how to know it, um, and what the best is that has been thought and said on the topic. Discover why the Magnus Fellowship is the fastest growing liberal arts learning community in the world by applying to become a Magnus Fellow right now at magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. You got to use that link because you get a special gift when you go to magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. Remember that your fellowship is completely free, live, online, interactive. It's good stuff. Check it out. Out of sheer abundance of Christmas joy, we have decided we're going to extend our Christmas offerings on Locals. You can still get Locals for a year, become a VIP for a year for just 40 bucks. It's usually 56 bucks. And we're going to keep that going past Christmas. I'm not turning into the Grinch like I usually do. Um, and it'll be going until January 15th. But then we really are cutting it off. That's the hard deadline, January 15th. So now is the time to sign up for Locals at youngheretics.com forward slash Locals. Being a Locals VIP is the only way you can ask mailbag questions, but it also comes with a bunch of other great stuff. It really is a phenomenal community. I'm blessed to be a part of it. Um, we do weekly live stream Q and A's where I answer a bunch of questions from VIPs. Um, I write essays and articles and translations that you can only find on locals. You can only get them there. Um, plus tons of tips about like what whiskey to drink and how to do the best bench press set and all that good stuff. Um, so go to youngheretics.com forward slash locals, still at a lower price, still just 40 bucks for the whole year um, until January 15th. Okay. Here's a question from Suijin. Inspired by the Daily Wire backstages, what are your three favorite and least favorite Christmas carols? Okay, I'm going to take the word carol uh, to be sort of widely extended here. And I'm also going to take the word uh, Christmas to be widely extended because there are some carols that I love um, that are actually Advent carols, which is to say they are uh, carols about the anticipation of the birth of the Lord rather than the celebration of the birth of the Lord. And I love, love, love O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. That's probably number one for me. Absolutely gorgeous, haunting, minor melody. Um, and so obviously, you know, that's that's got to be uh, an Advent carol because it's all about waiting for the coming of, of Emmanuel. I'm also, and this is where I'm going to take carol kind of widely, I'm also a total sucker um, for Morton Lauridsen's O Magnum Mysterium, um, which is a Latin text that describes the great mystery of the incarnation and the a virgin birth. Um, and, and that is a magnificent choral piece, um, which I could just which I listen to every year around this time and could listen to 
forever. Um, finally, finally, and this is the basic bro in me, I really like the pentatonics recording of Mary Did You Know? I wrote a whole article about it. Go to AmericanMind.org. It's called What Mary Knew. Um, I actually do think it's a really good song. So I, those are my three favorite Christmas carols. So as for my least favorite, I love Christmas carols so much that I really don't get down on that many of them. But there are a few, like two that I can think of, which get played on the radio every year, all the time, as if this were the one that we all want to hear. But who is asking for these songs? This is what I want to know. Happy Xmas War is over, the Beatles one. And do they know it's Christmas? Do they know it's Christmas time at all? Both acrobatically bland, just an absolute, you know, triumph of insipidity and, and uselessness. <laughs> Both of those songs, totally uninspired, totally uninspiring. Who is asking for these songs on the radio? And can I get you to stop? They just, they do not stop playing. And there are so many great Christmas carols. I mean, I haven't even mentioned the enormous wealth of American songbook recordings and Nat King Cole albums, one of the best albums ever recorded. Um, I don't know why we keep playing these songs when we have so many better songs available, but it's only really those two that I can think of that I hate. I do like, uh, you know, I don't love, but I like the Mariah Carey one. I don't want a lot for Christmas. All I want for Christmas is you. Um, but uh, yeah, so those are my three favorites. And I only have two least favorites, but I really, really hate them. All right. That's it for me. One more time, until January 15th, you can get a Locals VIP pass for 40 bucks instead of 56 bucks for the whole year. Uh, and that's until January 15th at youngheretics.com forward slash locals. Thanks as always for listening. If you like this show, you will love the Claremont Institute where I work. I mentioned already a piece that I wrote at AmericanMind.org. We also have the Claremont Review of Books where uh, I also have a piece in the latest issue and it's about the Bible. So another seasonally appropriate thing to read. But it's not just me, obviously, who writes in these publications. They host some of the best writing in the conservative movement as far as I'm concerned. Go check it out and donate to support the Claremont Institute at Claremont.org forward slash donate. Let them know in the notes that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics. All right, folks, I will see you next week for more Truth, Beauty, and the Stuff that Matters.